Hey, welcome and good morning, everyone. It's 10 o'clock on this dreary Wednesday morning, which means it's time to learn here today. And we're learning about building benefits to complement original Medicare. My name is Randy Lober, your growth marketing manager here at Action Benefits, and happy to lead the majority of today's conversation. Uh, but here to add even more expertise on what I have uh, is Jessica Schmaltz, one of our account managers and perhaps even your account manager. Jessica, go ahead and say hi. Go ahead and say hi to the people before we get started. Hi, everyone. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Jessica Schmaltz. I've been with Action for almost 11 years now, and I started on the group, moved over to individual and then Medicare, although I've been getting Medicare certified since um, I started here, actually. So glad to be with you guys today. Thanks for joining us, Jess. I will appreciate your commentary and your knowledge throughout. And uh, without any further ado, let's get on the road and talk about what we're doing here today. First thing is, first, let's talk about four things I want you to know by the time you leave our uh, session here today. First is, I want you to be able to explain the coverage provided by Medicare Supplement or Medigap policies. Uh, six and one half dozen of the other. You're going to see some carriers and some pros call them med subs or Medicare supplements. Others will call them med Medigap. Means the same thing in this context. Second thing I want you to be able to do by the time we're done today is identify some of those guidelines for enrolling, switching, and dropping med sub policies should your beneficiary choose to do so. Third thing is we want to look at the cost and function of a variety of those policies as well. And we also want to take a look at prescription drug plans, which often and should pair nicely with your Medicare supplement plans to provide a more robust coverage and benefit solution for your beneficiaries. So you know who we are, you know what we're doing here today. I want to take just a moment to find out a bit about who is with us here in the room as well. You're going to see a poll on your screen, and it reads like this. Which statement best describes you? Is it A, you're new to the Medicare market? B, you have experience in the Medicare market, but you're new to working with action? C, you have some experience with Medicare and action, but could use a refresher? Or D, you're a seasoned pro and you just love spending time with action? Go ahead and uh, tell us which one best describes you, A, B, C, or D. We see is exactly what you see on your screen now. We can see uh, the percentage of our audience that voted for each answer, but we'll never know which of you voted for what answer uh, going forward here. So we're going to use a lot of polls throughout today's session to kind of check what you know and make sure uh, that you are up to speed and picking up what Jess and I are putting down here today. Uh, but I want you to rest in full comfort uh, knowing that uh, you're, you're not Put on blast here to us or anyone else, but based on what you do or you don't know. Uh, we don't know who chose these answers. But I do know that about half of you are brand new to Medicare and half of you are here for a refresher. That tells me it's probably okay with you if we spend some time with a bit of the basics here today, uh, especially at the beginning of this session where we talk about uh, how Medicare supplement and original Medicare work together. So that's what we'll do here right about now. So we're talking again today about, in the first half of the session, about supplement and Medigap policies, what costs they cover, how they can help your beneficiaries limit expenses, and how they expand some benefits available to your beneficiaries going forward. You know that Part A is uh, your inpatient coverage. It you know provides coverage for your beneficiaries when they're in the hospital for those facility fees, provides coverage at SNFs and other uh, inpatient settings as well. You know that Medicare Part B provides your outpatient coverage and indeed covers the hospital or pays the doctors in the or when your folks are in the hospital as well. But you also know that under Parts A and B, there are a variety of co-pays, deductible, co-insurance that your uh, beneficiaries must satisfy or pay going forward. Where Medigaps or Medicare supplements fit in is that they help to offset the cost or, or uh, cover the cost of those deductibles, co-pays, and co-insurance that your beneficiaries would be subject to under Medicare Parts A and or B, depending on the plan design. We should also point out that as Medicare supplements, with one exception, uh, do not add any additional benefits to Medicare. Uh, they only cover what Medicare covers. So you're not going to find a, a dental or vision or hearing benefit embedded in a Medicare supplement. Um, 
at least in terms of covering cost sharing under parts A and B here, you'll see some buy-up packages that we'll talk a little bit later. The Medicare supplements only cover and help your uh, beneficiaries become whole for the deductibles, copay, or coinsurance they'd be responsible for under parts A and or B. So to add a bit more to that, let's uh, talk, look at eight quick things to know about supplemental plans. If you know nothing else after you leave today, this is probably like some of the most foundational pieces you want to pay attention to. First is uh, eligibility for a Medicare supplement plan. Uh, start simple, at least. Your individual or your beneficiary must have both Medicare Parts A and B in order to apply for and enroll in one of these plans. These policies, as I just mentioned, only add on to those original Medicare benefits. They don't replace them. And that's a common misconception you probably hear when you're out in the market, right? A beneficiary might say, I just bought a Medicare supplement policy. I don't need to enroll in you know, original Medicare or I dropped my A and B because I have this med sop, right? It, it replaces it. I encourage you to fight that misconception. Um, supplement policy, you can't supplement what you don't have, right? Medicare supplement stands with original Medicare, not uh, in place of. These policies we should point out are purchased from private insurance carriers and pay secondary to original Medicare in every case. Um, so for a lot of folks who might you know, think Medicare is a singular entity, they, they kind of look for that Medicare supplement benefit. They don't know or realize that they need to go to a private insurer, which is where you as trusted health insurance professionals come in. Um, but again, that's a common misconception you'll probably hear out in the market as well. I have original Medicare. What do I need a private insurer for? Well, here's some of the options we might have for you. Members do pay a monthly premium for their supplement policy in addition to their Part B premium for Medicare. Uh, so there is no such thing as a free lunch. You got to pay for uh, your care somewhere, either up front or when you get care. If you're going the med sup route, you're generally paying for that uh, care in premium not necessarily in co-insurance and co-pays, but we'll talk about that more later on. Should note, uh, again, that especially if you have someone aging into Medicare, they're often used to being able to put their spouse or their dependents on their plan. With the Medicare supplement policy, that is not the case. Each supplement policy only covers one person, and there is no spousal coverage. However, many carriers will offer a, a household discount if someone else in the household does apply for apply for and enroll in a plan offered by the carrier, but they cannot be on the same policy. Each person does have to purchase their own policy to have supplement coverage. Any standardized supplement policy, which we'll talk about here, A through N is guaranteed renewable, which means once you're in, you're in with few exceptions, uh, like non-payment and things like that. You may not have a lot of these hanging around on your books anymore, um, but before 2006, before January 1st, uh, 2006, uh, many or some med sub plans did include prescription coverage with the inception of Part D on January 1st, 2026. Uh, you now need a Part D plan for drug coverage. And also, and we'll come back to this a few times here today, supplement policies are not allowed if your beneficiaries in a Medicare Advantage plan unless they are disenrolling with from that plan and going back to original Medicare, you can never have a med sup and a Medicare Advantage plan at the same time. Jess, I wanna pause here and check in with you. Is there anything you would add or clarify on these kind of eight foundational points? No, Randy, I think, um, you know, you covered everything and I know that you're gonna cover some more details further in the training, so. Okay, thank you. Let's talk about some things then that are not covered as part of these plans. And generally you're not gonna see coverage for long-term care or private duty nursing, prescription drug coverage, vision, dental, hearing. All those things because they're not covered by original Medicare won't be covered by your Medicare supplement policy. However, uh, carriers like Blue Cross, like Humana, like UHC, not you Priority Health yet, uh, but many carriers have begun offering dental vision hearing packages that you can layer on top of your Medicare supplement in order to stand, uh, you know, provide that more complete benefit solution for your uh, clients. 
Uh, even though, even though in some places, in some cases, if your beneficiary chooses not to buy up into that package, a lot of carriers are bundling discount programs uh, with for event dental, vision, and hearing as well. And so while that may not be insurance coverage, it might be enough to kind of soften the blow of the out-of-pocket costs they might otherwise incur, right, for whatever that uh, negotiated or cash price might be, depending on how the provider pays it. Long and short of it is, especially for those bottom three things, vision, dental, hearing, your beneficiaries do have options, uh, whether that's a standalone policy or a buy-up policy, uh, from the same carrier or from a, another one. I also should talk about and clarify what we're not talking about here today. Lots of folks will say, will carry different types of insurance and say, oh yeah, this goes along with my Medicare. And that's not exactly true. Um, the plans that are listed here on the screen, including uh, Medicare Advantage plans, prescription drug plans, Medicaid, uh, union plans, TRICARE, veterans benefits, long-term care policies, or uh, Indian Health Service, tribal and urban Indian health plans, those are all different, separate from Medicare supplement. They work differently than what we're talking about here today. And while some of them will coordinate with the original Medicare, they don't all play nicely here in the same sandbox. Um, with MedSup. Nothing coordinates with MedSup. Uh, to, to be frank, MedSup is, is its own. So all that said, uh, I, that's kind of a bit of a guardrail of what our discussion here is today. And just kind of check where we're at here today. I want to make sure that you can properly describe Medicare supplement plans. If a client asked you about them on the street, you're going to get another poll here on your screen. You're going to see this question and it's going to read, how would you best describe Medicare supplement plans? Is it A, they completely replace original Medicare, B, they're usually primary payers, C, they're secondary payers and cover some or all cost sharing you would see on parts A and B, or D, they may be purchased without the beneficiary having for having first enrolled in original Medicare. Which of these is true? And there is only one for the record. And look at how smart you all are. Of course, you all picked that uh, Medicare supplement plans are secondary payers and they cover some or all cost sharing. And that's an important distinction for your beneficiaries to know as you're talking, working and dealing with them going forward. All right, Jess, anything to add about this section before we dive into uh, some of the policies and how they work? No, um, well, I know that we do get a lot of questions on you know, Medicaid and, and can someone have a supplement with Medicaid? And the answer is no. So um, mm -hmm. we do get quite a few questions on that. So I just want to, that slide that you had is very helpful. So thanks for having that. Thank you. And that, that, that's a, important to, to emphasize, right? If, if you the question ever is, will Medicare supplement coordinate with anything else? Or can I have another policy and Medicare supplement? Uh, the answer is likely no, they, they don't play together in the same sandbox. Um, all right, so let's talk about enrollment periods. Before we talk about what the policies are and things like that, let's talk about how you get one first. And let's talk a little, the two main ways uh, or two main venues, your or avenues is the better word, uh, that your beneficiaries would have to access these policies. And one is during their Medigap or MedSup open enrollment period. And they can also access these policies outside of open enrollment via uh, what are called guaranteed issue rights or non-guaranteed issue uh, periods here as well. We're going to dive deeper into all three of these over the next few slides. So let's take a look at open enrollment first. What does that mean? Uh, six and this is a six-month period that begins when your beneficiary turns 65 and, in and is enrolled in Part B. So the clock doesn't start ticking uh, when they are 65, the clock start, starts ticking when they are both 65 and uh, their Part B becomes effective. Once uh, that date hits, then they have six months for their Medigap open en enrollment period. During this period, they're not subject to medical underwriting, which means you could be the sickest person in the world and not be upcharged for premium. You could have diabetes, you could have cancer, so on and so forth. You're not subject uh, to medical underwriting and applications can't be denied, but that's only true during the six month window or during some GI periods, which we'll talk about here in just a moment. We should also mention that inside this period here, there's no waiting periods. There's no elimination period before you use your benefits. There's no probationary period. 
I, none of those things that would delay access to benefits can be included in policies that are written on this basis. <clears throat> so during open enrollment, the six month window when you turn uh, 65 and have part B, when both those things are true, that's the first best time to buy a med sup policy. You also point out that uh, there's people under 65 that can be eligible for Medicare supplements too, whether they're eligible for Medicare based on uh, having end stage renal disease or having, uh, you know, collecting their 25th month of dis uh, disability from Social Security Administration. These folks may enroll in a uh, Medicare supplement plan, but it will likely not be the plan of their choice. Michigan requires that any carrier that offers MedSup here within our state borders offers at least one MedSup plan to these members. Generally, though, they're offering plan A to those members, and as we'll see in a few moments, uh, that's not the most benefit-rich plan uh, going forward. Um, so when, you, when you're looking at, uh, that's just something to keep in mind. You do have folks that may be eligible for MedSup uh, that are under 65, but it's likely not where they're always going to want to be. We should also talk a bit about guaranteed issue rights. So this is outside of that six month period. Once that six month open enrollment period is passed, there are a few times where you do have guaranteed issue rights or where your beneficiary has access to guaranteed issue rights. Generally, these GI rights apply when your beneficiary has a change in other healthcare coverage that would cause them to uh, buy a new MedSup policy. So if they lose group healthcare coverage, uh, maybe they are working <laughs> a little bit later on, they lose their group health care coverage. Uh, that loss of coverage would trigger GI rights for them. If they're in a Medicare Advantage plan and that plan closes up shop and uh, removes that county from the service area, and we might see a lot of that coming up, especially as new network adequacy requirements go in place, um, that could trigger GI rights for them. If they choose to use their trial period and they quit their Medicare Advantage plan within the first year of joining, they would have guaranteed issue rights for a med sub policy. If their Medigap carrier goes bankrupt, which is a bad state for everyone to be in, um, but especially if your Medigap carrier goes bankrupt, you'd be in a position to claim GI rights. Or if your Medigap or Medicare Advantage carrier commits fraud or otherwise misleads the consumer, including uh, were their agent to mislead the consumer, that could trigger GI rights. Not you, of course, you're all upstanding people, but should someone else out there uh, mislead the consumer, that could trigger GI rights. During these GI periods, carriers must sell a policy to the beneficiary. They must cover all pre-existing health conditions and they can't upcharge you based on your health status. They can't use medical underwriting. Uh, so that it's guaranteed issue and it's guaranteed issue at the carrier's preferred rate or their base rate um, for that policy. Jess, anything to add about GI before we talk about non-GI? So I do want to add um, when they're under 65 and they enroll in a, one of the med sub plans that's available to them, um, you know, they do have that next IEP when they turn 65. So they do have an opportunity to get into a MedSup mm -hmm. guaranteed issue at 65. The other thing is if they're enrolled in a MedSup under age 65, then they want to fill out a new enrollment form because they won't, like at least with Blue Cross, they won't automatically re-rate them based off of their new age. So they'd want to fill out a new application at that time. Great points about under 65, um, that, um, that when they turn 65, right, it, it kind of unlocks the, the whole world again as they uh, begin or begin their medical journey again, whether they have uh, GI rights here, they could go into a Medicare Advantage plan. Everything kind of, the clock starts over when they turn 65, when they age into the program uh, or become eligible by uh, virtue of age. Should also mention that GI rights are only good for 63 days from the uh, from any of the events that we uh, name here. So if your Medicare Advantage plan leaves the area, you have 63 days, let's call it two months, to uh, get a MedSup policy. If you uh, quit your Medicare Advantage plan within the first year of joining, you have 63 days, read that as two months just to cover your bases, to get into your MedSup policy. Uh, that time frame is important to know. 
Let's talk about non-guaranteed issue uh, rights here as well. Um, during non-guaranteed issue, gun guaranteed issue time. So when you are outside of that open enrollment period or when you don't have GI rights, you can still buy a med sup whenever you want, but there's some rules your care your beneficiary will have to play by. So for example, uh, if I am outside of that six month window and don't have GI rights, I can apply to any carrier I want, but that carrier can use medical underwriting. So they can look at uh, my age, my geography, my gender, my tobacco use. They can also uh, figure out whether I have a history of cancer, stroke, diabetes, asthma. They have their own underwriting rules that they can use to uh, either upcharge or in some cases deny coverage. Should point out that of the carriers that we work with, um, Blue Cross will not deny you uh, for any reason, for any medical reason, uh, they will upcharge you, right? They'll put you in their highest rating tier. So if you have someone who cannot find a med sub policy anywhere else, but they're insisting that's the way they go, Blue Cross could be a good option. Um, but because, to be frank, uh, uh, Blue Cross does take on the extra risk, right? You'll often see their rates sort of reflect that uh, when you're shopping around here as well. So one thing to keep in mind, uh, though the rates are fairly competitive with other people as well, but if you're wondering why Blue Cross might be a few dollars here or there, it's likely because they, they have that extra risk baked in um, from covering everyone, uh, regardless of health status. Hey, Randy, I do want to jump in there. Um, yep. If if an agent is has someone who's a non-GI, um, we can do a quote not necessarily the enrollment, um, and this is strictly really for Blue Cross, but if they fill out an application, um, have the member fill out an application with all of that medical underwriting, and then we'll plug it into the system to see what tier rating tier they fall under um, prior to the member making the decision to enroll. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I should point out, uh, while we're talking about health conditions as well, uh, coverage for one, powered by Sunfire, just got a huge update as well. We'll be talking more uh, to you, our agent community, about that in the, in the coming days and weeks, uh, where it will give you some underwriting advice as you're answering questions here. So it, it'll say, you know, as you're saying yes or no to a variety of health questions, it's going to say, uh, you've been knocked out of the XYZ carriers here, or uh, MedSup really isn't a good fit because nobody will cover this person based on, on you know, the level of risk you're saying here uh, outside of Blue Cross, right? Um, so more to come on that, but uh, there is there are lots of ways to get advice on what that underwriting could look like and how that could impact your uh, beneficiary's application. Should also talk about the free look period, and this is not really, it's kind of a misnomer, but it's what everyone calls it anyway. Free look period is a tryout month for a Medicare supplement policy, but it's not really free because your beneficiary must pay both premiums during that 30-day period. So say, for example, they're in one carrier's, maybe it's a purple color, uh, Plan G, and they want to see what another carrier's Plan G is like. Maybe they want to go to a green colored one. Uh, they can have both for 30 days, no more than 30 days, and they were paying both premiums uh, during those 30 days and they must terminate one of those at the end of the 30-day period. Um, so it gives them a chance to kind of, to see what it's like, to see if that carrier provides a different experience or the other, the new carrier would provide a different experience for them. But again, they cannot hold uh, both policies past that 30-day period. They will have to terminate one at the end of that 30-day period. Should also mention some uh, cases where Medicare, where your beneficiaries could be uh, dropped from MedSup coverage and likely you're going to know, know this one or have to bat if your med, if your beneficiary doesn't pay for their meds sub coverage of course the carrier is not going to continue to insure them if they have anything on their application that was found to be untrue and gosh here is one thing where we've heard about agents getting dinged right uh so a uh, beneficiary puts down like six or seven medications on their lit on their medication list but doesn't check anything on, uh, doesn't say they have any health conditions on the application itself. A lot of carriers are coming back to the agents and going, wait a minute, how can they not have all these any of these conditions and be taking these seven medications for uh, diabetes, for asthma, for X, Y, and Z sort of thing? Uh, so that can be a case where applications can uh, be, or policies can be terminated if uh, that 
information was found to be materially untrue. You might also find that the carrier would re-rate or uprate your uh, client based on uh, what they find there in underwriting as well. And of course, if the carrier goes bankrupt, they, there's no one there to insure your uh, your member's risk anymore. So uh, the, the, that would be another case where it would not be renewed. On the right-hand side, I, again, as time marches on, you may not have more of the, much of, or many of these on your books anymore. But if someone bought a med sub policy prior to 1992, where things began to coalesce and become standardized, they may not be guaranteed renewable. But the carrier would need approval from the state to terminate that policy. And the, if that does happen, the individual would have GI rights to purchase another policy. Jess, anything to add here about uh, dropping or underwriting or applications or anything else on your mind? <laughs> no, I think we covered it. Thanks, Randy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's check in with a quick knowledge check then and talk about James here. James turned 65 last month and is enrolled in Medicare Parts A and B. He's concerned that his type 1 diabetes might impact the premiums he pays for a MedSup plan. What could you, his trusty agent, say to reassure him? Is it A, he's within his MedSup open enrollment period and has guaranteed issue rights? So there's no rating here. They don't, they don't care about pre-existing conditions. Is it B, he's within his MedSup open enrollment period, but his health history may impact the premium he pays. So they could rate him for his type, type 1 diabetes here. Or is it C, he's outside of his open enrollment period and is subject to medical underwriting? Which of these is true when there is only one that is true? And uh, again, you're you're all right here, which means I, I'm either, Jess and I are doing I, our jobs really well, or you all knew a bunch of stuff before you came in and you're really just here for the refresher. One or both of those things is true. We'll find out as we go forward here. Let's talk a little bit about those policy functions and cost, how these policies work, what they cover, what they don't cover, and how uh, the carriers we uh, support stack up here. After I take that poll off your screen. Okay, so uh, there are a there's a library here, plans A, B, D, G, K, L, M, and N that are all standardized here across the entire country, with the exception of three states, Wisconsin. Uh, Maryland and Minnesota, where their med subs are a little bit different. But for us right now, here, because we're in Michigan, maybe we're in Indiana, Ohio, uh, this is what the med sub market looks like, and this is what's available to you. Uh, plan C and F are still out there, but uh, if you're newer to the market, you know you're not running into people who are eligible for them anymore because they, uh, if you have a Part B effective date after 1-1 of 2020, you can no longer enroll in a plan C or a plan F. So that's why you see those covered up here on your screen. But you do see how the each of these plans uh, covers a variety of benefits here, your Part A coinsurance and hospital costs, uh, your Part B copays and coinsurance, your uh, first three pints of blood, uh, hospice care, which is covered on most policies here as well at some percentage, Skilled nursing facility or SNF care, Part A deductibles, Part B deductibles, excess charges, and foreign travel emergencies. Um, <clears throat> each of these plans, of course, offers a variety of benefits to your uh, beneficiaries for them to consider. Part G tends to be fairly popular. It does have the richest benefits on the screen. It can't cover the Part B deductible because plans, uh, you know, as you age in after 2020, or, uh, not, no policy can cover your Part B deductible here. The other one that often gets sold, talked about in the same breath as Plan G is Plan N, where you have most of the same benefits, except there is a copay when you do go to visit, or a coinsurance rather, as, as you go to visit PCPs and it's obtain other services here as well. Not captured on the chart here, uh, but those are two of the more strong com uh, competitors when you look at that. We partner with a variety of carriers here in the Blue Cross market or in the Medigap market in Michigan. Um, every carrier, if they work in Michigan and they offer meds up, has to offer Plan A. Uh, everything on top of that is a little bit of bit of gravy. Uh, so you see that United Healthcare, for example, offers the most variety of uh, Met Medigap plans here within the state. Um, but if, if you look at everybody's portfolio, you see some commonalities. You see A, C, G, N. Nearly everyone has them. 
And that, tend, that G and that N tend to be where a lot of enrollments end up uh, based on, again, the beneficiary's preference for uh, balancing that premium versus out-of-pocket cost when they seek care. All that said, each of these carriers does have their own household discount, discount programs, which your account manager is happy to talk to you a little bit about um, and, and find the best fit for your beneficiaries. You can quote most of these inside uh, coverage for one powered by Sunfire as well to, to see how those rates really strap up or stack up against each other. And of course, uh, it, the de devil's always in the details. You have to look at some of that dental vision buy-up coverage uh, that the carrier may offer or standalone dental or vision or hearing coverage the carrier may offer as well. And again, we can spend a little bit more time with that uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis or as you're working through a particular case. Should also talk a little bit about rating with these carriers here as well. Um, and again, not a deep dive into rating and methodologies because I'm not an actuary and not, <laughs> probably I would guess neither are any of you, but I can tell you about the a variety of uh, rating methodologies carriers can use and which ones our partner carriers uses, use rather. On the left-hand side of your screen where you see six of our partner carriers sit, uh, you see attained age rating, where the premium is based on the beneficiary's current age, and that is the only factor, uh, aside from smoking, they might take into account uh, as the beneficiary rate, uh, ages. So if you, you buy in at 65, uh, you move to 66, you get a new rate, 67, you get a new rate, 68, you get a new rate, so on and so forth, up until uh, whenever the carrier cuts that off, generally around the 80, 81 mark. Some carriers, although none of the ones we work with, uh, base their premiums on issue age. So maybe you buy in at 67 and you, you're gonna pay that premium forever uh, as you go in. Not too common here in the market. And you can probably imagine why as people get older, uh, they tend to cost insurers a bit more money uh, for the variety of care they might need. And so, uh, you know, as you look at, that expense ratio going forward, that medical loss ratio going forward, doesn't often look favorable for the carrier in that case. Some carriers, and one of the carriers that we partner with, United Healthcare, uh, does rate their med sub plans on a community rated basis, uh, much like they would rate a small group ACA plan or an individual ACA plan. Premiums are based on where the beneficiary lives and some other factors. And you might be saying, wait a minute, Randy, if it's community rated, why do their rates increase every year when they age? And that's because UHC is really clever in how they design their rates. Essentially, what they say is their base rate is for the 81-year-old, and they give everyone that's not 81, so your, your 79, your 65, your 67-year-olds, a 3% discount um, on you know per year under 81 on their rates. So uh, it effectively looks like attained age rated going forward. But if you were to open up their rate book and, and take a spin around Michigan, you're going to see they have different rates for different areas of the state here uh, going forward. And again, uh, that might explain why you see different rates in uh, for UHC and Blue Cross in, you know, in the same zip, right? Uh, they may maybe more than a few dollars apart because UHC is rating that area a little bit differently than the universal attained range that uh, at or attained age that everyone else is carrying. Let's uh, check in on what you know about these policies going forward and, and check in on any questions you might have here as well. The next poll you see on your screen will look a bit like this one. Which of these statements is or are true? And I'll give you a hint, there are two that are true. Is it A, all med set pol policies or plans will cover 80% of the cost of foreign emergencies? B, members with an effective date after 1-1-2020 are not eligible for plans that pay for the Part B deductible. Or C, Medicare supplement plans will cover at least part of the coinsurance for Part B. Which two of these are true? I'll give you, I'll give you that hint. Randy, um, Dave did have a question yeah. in the chat. He just wants to know if it's um, this will be emailed out to agents, this presentation. Yes, it will. Uh, so in about 24 hours from 10 o'clock, so uh, 23 hours from now, Dave, an, uh, an email from Zoom will hit your inbox uh, with the recording of this session.
And let's take a look at where our results pan out here. Um, a in this case is not true. So if we're looking at the foreign travel emergencies here, uh, not all Medicare supplement plans cover 80%. A plans A and B do not cover that those foreign travel emergencies at all. Neither do plans K and L, which means uh, B and C are true in this case. Uh, Jess, anything to add about policies and product before we uh, switch gears and talk about PDPs? No, I, I think you covered it. I mean, most of the time we see, you know, enrollment in the plan G. Um, you know, there still are people who like the plan N, um, but maybe are going away from that because of those co-pays. So mm -hmm. I think you covered that pretty well. Okay, thank you. Then in the last, uh, the home stretch of today's session here, we'll talk about PDPs. And we have, um, the, the reason we bundle them together is because probably in most cases, your beneficiaries would want to bundle, the, bundle these together as well. When we talked about med subs, we didn't say PDPs or mention drugs at all, other than to say the med subs don't cover them. So where does your person get drug coverage? Well, it's via a PDP when they pair it with a, a med sub plan or, or med sub plan. So these uh, PDPs, prescription drug coverage, are available for all people with Medicare Part A and or B and reside in a planned service area. And I, I want to emphasize that and or. Uh, you don't have to have Part B to get a uh, Part D plan. As long as you have one of the two, uh, you can be eligible for Part D coverage. But if you only have one of the two, you would not be able to enroll in the meds up. Two main routes your beneficiaries can access Part D coverage, and one of them is through Medicare prescription drug plans, which we'll talk about here today. The other route is Medicare Advantage plans, or at least most Medicare Advantage plans. Some do CARP prescription benefits out. And again, we should mention that PDPs are run by private companies that do contract with Medicare to provide these benefits to your beneficiaries. Premium for your Part D plans are not automatically deducted from your social security benefit. So somewhat, you're somewhere along the line, your beneficiary has got to be uh, writing the check or the uh, auto debit or whatever the case might be um, to, to pay the policy here. Part D plans are optional, but there is a life, or there may be a rather a lifetime penalty for late enrollment, which we'll talk about here in just a moment. And any beneficiary who is higher income may be subject to IRMA or the income related monthly adjustment amount. That amount is deducted from the social security benefit, but it has no uh, impact on the premium charged by private carriers, uh, which means if your beneficiary is subject to IRMA, the carrier is not collecting that, social security is in this case. Uh, although I guess to clarify, if you're if you're a beneficiary is subject to an LEP, the carrier knows that the carrier does collect that late enrollment penalty, which we'll highlight a little bit later on. What does Irma look like? I uh, well, you don't have to worry about it, and if unless you're an individual who makes ninety seven thousand uh, dollars or more, or if you're married filing jointly, who uh, and you combined you make one hundred ninety four thousand dollars or more. Uh, then you're going to be paying uh, in these brackets that you see here on the screen. Otherwise, uh, and I should note that IRMA really only affects about, depending on the given year, 5 to 6% of the population. So generally speaking, a lot of your, your uh, beneficiaries, your clients, don't have to worry about these here. But if you have a high earner, someone in that $97,000 to $123,000 range, they might be paying $1,290 to Social Security on top of whatever they pay their carrier, for their plan premium, all the way up to your $500,000 earners who may be paying $81 on top of their plan premium. And again, that $81 goes to uh, Social Security, not to the carrier. Part D benefits work a bit differently than a lot of prescription benefits your folks might be familiar with. Um, Probably most folks are familiar with a deductible, though they don't always are or may not be used to having one on their prescription benefits. Uh, many Part D plans do have a deductible. In fact, if you were to look around at a lot of the plans, um, <laughs> uh, the, the lower premium plans, you're going to see deductibles, especially attached around tier four and five drugs. And if there is a deductible, you will see uh, your member is going to pay full price for that until deductible is reached. Some plans do not have a deductible, so they'll be your uh, full 
beneficiary will begin the plan in stage two, that initial coverage stage. Uh, here in this stage, co-pays and co-insurance can vary, by, uh, vary from plan to plan, and your beneficiary stays in this page until their total drug costs, so what they and their uh, the carrier spend on their drug coverage reaches $5,030. Stage three is the coverage gap. It's no longer called the donut hole. It's called the coverage gap now. And during that stage, uh, your beneficiary is subject to no more than 25% of the cost of their drugs. Uh, the rest is split between the manufacturer and the carrier. And they'll remain there until they reach their out-of-pocket costs, reach $8,000. And what's new here in stage, or stage four is in 2024, that 5% co-insurance in the catastrophic phase has disappeared. And instead, Part D plans are picking up the slack there. They're covering 20% of the drug costs instead of the previous 15. I do see a Q&A pop in the chat as we're looking here. <clears throat> and Joanne asks us, does that IRMA charge go down if their earnings go down in subsequent years? Uh, so yeah, let me pop back to IRMA for a minute. Should have mentioned that IRMA look is a two-year look back. So in 2024, uh, they look... The IRS looks back at what the couple or the, what the single filed in 2022 and bases the IRMA upcharge based on that. Uh, so if you get into 2023, uh, so for 2025, you'd look at your 2023. Uh, for 2026, you'd look at your 2024, so on and so forth. If, however, the IRMA does present a, a problem uh, for any reason for your beneficiaries, there is an appeal process they can file. Um, to get that removed. However, it does take a bit of legwork to get through. Jess, I see that you might have something to add to that as well. No, I'm okay. I was just trying to um, update the Q&A so okay. to say that you answered it live and it took okay. me off mute, <laughs> but you're good. Good Keep deal. Going. All right. Um, so as we said here, Part D, uh, the stage four gets removed here. Um, and moving forward into talking about that LEP here as well. So in, uh, late enrollment penalties for Part D can stick around for life. So you want to be real careful about these and your beneficiaries want to be real careful about these as well. If they don't enroll when they're first eligible for Part D coverage or they have a break in what's called creditable coverage of more than 63 days, uh, they're going to be subject to this late enrollment penalty and be responsible for it for the rest of the time they have Part D benefits. When we talk about creditable coverage, we're talking about coverage that is at least as good as what a Medicare plan might offer. Most employer plans, for example, meet this definition. Um, so if they choose to keep working beyond 65, uh, they'll have to work with their HR professional to see uh, whether or not their plan uh, does meet that de creditable definition. But in any case, if they don't have creditable coverage for more than 63 days, which means they leave employment and are out of a Part D plan for more than the 63 days, late enrollment penalty starts racking up. And here's what it looks like. CMS looks at the all of the Part D plans all around the nation and averages their premium together. And they figure out what 1% of that premium is. And then uh, that compounds for every month your person was eligible and not enrolled. So if they were uh, eligible for Part D and not enrolled for 24 months, they're adding 24% out of their Part D premium. That is in place uh, for the duration of the coverage for however long your person has Part D benefits. And again, that's added to the Part D premium. Your carriers will know whether the person has a Part D penalty and the carriers are in charge of collecting that Part D penalty as well. Randy, yeah. Dave did have a question in the chat. I don't know if you want to answer it live. I saw you typing an answer. Um, go for it. Okay. So in the this stage three during the coverage gap, it says you pay no more than 25% mm -hmm. of the cost of the drug. So I mean, that's a little tricky, I feel like, because it's it's the 25%, you know, I guess if you go to one pharmacy, obviously you'd want to go to a, a preferred pharmacy, but each preferred pharmacy has a different like um, amount that they've contracted with that pharmace pharmaceutical company. So you might find 
um, Rite Aid, for example, might charge, you know, let's say $99 for the drug. Um, but maybe it's 1100 at another preferred pharmacy. So, you know, making sure you're doing that due diligence and, and going to really looking at all of the pharmacies, but it's whatever that cost is of, of the drug. So they're only paying 25%. So there could be some fluctuations. Usually it's not a ton of money, but there could be, you know, yep. a few dollars difference from pharmacy to pharmacy. Absolutely. And for some really good estimates, Dave, and for everyone else of what your beneficiary could be subject to, uh, if you were to plug in the drug list and uh, the, the plan and pharmacy into coverage for one, uh, you'll, you'll be able to see exactly when your beneficiary would hit the coverage gap and exactly what their, uh, well, not exactly, but a good estimate of what their out-of-pocket liability might be at each page and uh, you know welcome the chance to talk about each of you or to talk about that with you and again uh, as we talk about some of the updates that have been made to coverage for one we'll probably be talking about with you that uh, that with you in May as well just talked about LEPs the other thing that's been in the news a lot lately is of course the Inflation Reduction Act uh, so want to give you a quick overview of how that is impacting Part D coverage here too 2023, um, we see those inflation rebates start to come into play for both Part B and Part D drugs. In short, is uh, the policy is if the price of a drug outplaces the rate of inflation, the carrier owes rebates uh, back to Medicare. And, and, the, and in fact, those rebates uh, reduce the coinsurance that a beneficiary would have to pay for those Part B or Part D drugs. Last year made big news in the Medicare market. Of course, that insulin is limited, was limited to $35 copay per month, no matter the dose, uh, so long as the carrier covered it. And it did reduce the cost for adult kids vaccines. Here in 2024, we're uh, a few months into 2024 now, um, but that catastrophic coverage stage, uh, that 5% coinsurance has been eliminated here in 2024. Uh, depending on what you know drugs and what conditions your beneficiaries might be have or might be living with. Uh, they might have been uh, used to running into that uh, right about now, right, as deductibles, as other coverage phases run out here. So that provides some relief to them here as well. Uh, the other thing we should point out is that eligibility for LIS for Part D, low-income subsidies, which didn't quite fit into the fit into this session, but uh, what it does provide some premium and, and some cost, uh, some copay help uh, for your uh, beneficiaries who are low-income. If they make less than 150% of federal poverty level for their uh, household size, uh, they do have uh, increased eligibility for LIS. 2025 is the big one and probably uh, the one a lot of your folks have circled on their calendars. In As of 1-1-2025, there'll be a $2,000 out-of-pocket cap on all Part D costs. And that is a hard cap, not like a soft cap like the uh, catastrophic paid or stage used to be. That's a straight $2,000 cap that your beneficiaries will get the uh, benefit of in 2025. In 2026 and beyond, we'll, we'll see uh, the fruits of Medicare's labor in negotiating drug prices for both Part D and Part B drugs as well. All that said, let's talk about Jasmine real quick before we head into our home stretch. Uh, Jasmine takes several maintenance medications, and I'm pulling up this poll here for you as well. Jasmine takes several maintenance medications to help control her cholesterol and blood pressure. She'd like to explore prescription drug coverage to reduce her out-of-pocket costs. Which of the following statements are true for her? Is it A, she may have to first meet a deductible, deductible before Part D plan helps with her costs? B, Medicare will deduct an additional amount from her Social Security benefit if her income exceeds $97,000, that IRMA charge, or C, Jasmine will not have a co-payment after her out-of-pocket costs reach $8,000. Which of those three are true? Oh, I gave you the wrong poll on the screen, huh? Oops. Let's try that again. Let's try number four instead of number five. That probably looks, that probably looks more like what you see on your screen. Let's go with that one. I'll give you uh, 30 seconds or so to, to weigh in. Okay, so as we take a look at this one, uh, all three in this case are true. She may have to meet a deductible. Uh, if her income does exceed $97,000, she uh, will be subject to that IRMA upcharge. 
And if she she will not have a copayment when she reaches that catastrophic phase as well. Jess, anything to add about coverage phases before we talk about uh, some of those enrollment periods throughout the year? No, but, I, you know, we do get a lot of questions. Um, you know, maybe sometimes people don't realize they're in one coverage gap or the other. So um, making sure that member has their evidence of coverage. Um, and then they should really be paying attention to their mail because I know at least Blue Cross will send notifications to members um, when they reach a certain coverage gap or period. Um, so just make sure they're paying attention and you're doing your due diligence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great advice. So let's talk about some enrollment periods here before we wrap up here today. There's a variety of situations where your enrollees, where your beneficiaries could qualify for a Part D plan. Say, for example, they are newly eligible for Medicare because they just turned 65. They have the opportunity to sign up for a Part D plan either during uh, their original Medicare IEP or if they take advantage advantage pun kind of intended, of their Medicare Advantage trial rights. So if they try a Medicare Advantage uh, plan in those first 12 months, but say, eh, that's not for me, I'd rather have MedSup and a PDP, uh, they could pick up a PDP as part of that. If they're newly eligible for Medicare because they have a disability and they're under age 65, they can uh, sign up for a Part D plan as well. But again, that is subject to when their Medicare coverage starts. Uh, so again, that their IEP would start 21 months after the benefits begin and last to the 28th month of their Social Security disability benefits. If they're already eligible for Medicare because of a disability and are now turning 65, uh, then it's kind of just like an IEP again for them, right? They can sign up for a Part D plan. They can switch to it uh, from their current one to another one or drop their Part D plan completely. Um, and again, that's during their original Medicare IEP that triggers when they turn 65. If they have Part A and enroll in Part B for the first time during GEP, general enrollment period, between January 1st and March 31st, their benefits uh, will begin on the first of next month, uh, only if they get into an MAPD plan. You should also look at some of those uh, yearly enrollment periods here as well. Of course, during AEP, they have a lot of flexibility with their drug coverage. Uh, during AEP, they can join a Medicare uh, PDP, they can switch PDPs from one to another or drop prescription drug coverage completely if they so choose, although I don't know if that's a great choice for anyone. And from January 1st to March 31st of every year, so during MAOEP, they can make one change uh, to their coverage. If they're in a Medicare Advantage plan, they can switch to another one, of course. They do have the option though, and this is bolded here, to disenroll from Medicare Advantage and return to original Medicare. That does allow them the, uh, the option to uh, join a, a PDP during that time. <clears throat> and again, uh, if they look at those first three months of having Medicare with those trial rights, they again have options for switching. And there are some things, of course, your members can't do during MAOEP. They can't switch from original Medicare to a, a Medicare Advantage plan. They can't join a PDP if they're in original Medicare, which is especially relevant here. They can only join that P PDP for the first time or rejoin a PDP during AEP. And they cannot change PDPs during that MAOEP either, that January 1st to March 31st window. That is really only built for Medicare Advantage coverage. If they do lose creditable coverage or have other exceptional circumstances, again, they have that 63-day period where they can uh, join a PDP. That's their special enrollment period here as well. <clears throat> Um, and that really brings us close to the end of our hour here today. So if you've taken away nothing else, I want you to take away these few things. First, original Medicare, Medicare supplement, and Part D plans all combined provide more comprehensive coverage for your members. And it's uh, often beneficial to find dental benefit, dental vision and hearing coverage to bundle with those as well. The best way to avoid an LEP is to enroll when you're first eligible and ensure continuity of benefits. Uh, <clears throat> the only thing probably worse than having an LEP is having no coverage whatsoever, right? Uh, so make sure you're in regular contact with your clients, with your prospects, and, and working with them on their timelines to find out uh, when they plan to quit working, for example, when they do plan to retire to make sure they have coverage in force from day one. And again, I, if you're thinking about that MedSub versus MedAdvantage debate, 
the the med sub plus part D uh, portfolio that bundle generally works better for those who want to pay more upfront for care who don't mind paying a little bit of premium, but they might be on a uh, a fixed income, right? And you might say, Randy, well, if they're on a fixed income, how are they affording that Part D or the med sub and the Part D premium? And to that, I would say, uh, if you have that med sup, right, that 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 uh, all you're paying is premium. If you're if you're in a Part G, right, you're paying your Part D B deductible, you're paying your Part B premium, and whatever you might have for drugs there as well. But your costs are fairly predictable in that case, as compared to a Medicare Advantage, uh, where you know you're you might have a zero dollar premium, but your out of pocket costs, you know, per episode of care uh, may swing wildly from place to place or time to time. So that could be, you know, a, a balance point there as well. Uh, as we are close to the top of the hour, again, I want to thank uh, Jessica for helping us out here today. I want to thank each of you for spending time with us here and just brushing up on some of this Medicare supplement knowledge and, knowledge and PDP knowledge here as well. Uh, just any parting words for our audience before we uh, ask for questions for them? Not anything crazy, but definitely reach out to us, your account managers, um, you know, the individual team. If you have questions, um, we're more than happy to answer anything that you throw our way. Uh, we'll always look forward to maybe a, an additional learning experience. Sometimes we get thrown some hard questions and you know, we have to do a little research, but that just makes us stronger together. So definitely keep sending stuff and um, we'd love to hear from you. Yes, please give Jessica all of your hard questions <laughs> um, or the rest of the team too. They're all they're all well equipped to answer your team and uh, your questions. In fact, I see many of them here on the call with us, people like Renee or Kevin or Andrew or Kat uh, or Becca here as well. Uh, everyone here on the team is happy to answer your questions as you uh, call in the individual line or or mail the individual box. All that said, I want to thank you again for your time today. I'm going to stop the recording here, um, but Jess and I are happy to stick around for any more questions that you may have about Medicare supplement or anything else that is on your mind. <laughs>